Yes, yes. Well, you know, here we are getting to the climax. This is what it's all about. This is where the Holy Ghost... Uh, writing, you know, through the uh, prophets and apostles, focuses so much attention as this uh, crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why he came. He was born to die. And uh, this 19th chapter, we're going to see Jesus Christ as the uplifted Savior in John's Gospel. And the first 15 verses, we're going to see how Christ is uh, rejected and then crucified. And in those first 15 verses of rejection, we see, um, we'll read through, Uh, Pilate, uh, verse 1, therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and they said, O hail, king of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. They're mocking him. Pilate therefore went uh, forth again, and saith unto them, unto the people, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know I find no fault in him. And then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns, and the purple robe, and there was so much blood on it, it says in one of the other gospel accounts, it was turning to scarlet, uh, as he had been beaten, and uh, Pilate held him up before the people, and and saith unto them, verse 5, Behold the man, look at him, look at him, all beaten up, bloody, I mean, surely that's enough. Verse 6, when the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate saith unto them, No, take ye him and crucify him. You do it. I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, We have a law. By our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now they're perverting and twisting scriptures back in Leviticus, uh, uh, confusing the concept of uh, blasphemy. And uh, Jesus hadn't blasphemed. That's what they accused him of blasphemy. But he hadn't blasphemed. He had merely stated the truth. I am the Son of God. The Jews again had it backwards, and and we all get things backwards. We are backwards-thinking people. Uh, We think upside down. Uh, We think wrong in our natural state. And so here they say, uh, he made himself the Son of God. This, This mere man made himself the Son of God. Well, in actuality, we know from reading the Scriptures, Uh, He was the Son of God from everlasting to everlasting, and the Son of God made Himself a man. The Word was made flesh. It's just the opposite of what the Jews thought. And, And truth is just the opposite of what we think in our natural minds. Our natural minds cannot discover truth. Uh, Reasoning and rationalism will not reveal truth to us. So all the philosophers come up with the wrong answers. Um, empiricism and scientific observation and experiment will not lead to spiritual truth. So the scientists have it wrong. And the Big Bang, creation, all the theories that men have come up with in the vain imaginations of their mind are wrong. Truth must be revealed. It is a revelation from above, brought down from the Father of Spirits, Every good and perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights, and He has to give us the revelation of truth. And He did it by the Word of God, the Son of God made flesh, and He did it by the Spirit of God working through men writing the Scriptures. So the Jews had it backwards. They had it wrong. I had it backwards. I had it wrong. Until the revelation came in the form of Scripture. Praise God for the Scriptures. So the Jews uh, are confused here. And verse 8, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, what, that he's the Son of God, he was the more afraid. Pilate now be, has more fear in him than the Jews do. Now you would think the Jews would have more fear because they're familiar with the Bible. And reading the Bible ought to put the fear of God in someone because it's a recognition of the real God of the Bible, not some made-up God. But Pilate was afraid. Pilate was afraid for a number of reasons. Number one, his own observations back in Matthew 27, when he had observed that when this so-called uh, criminal, this accused man was brought before him, in, in contradistinction, everyone else that's ever been brought before him was begging for their lives and pleading their innocence. It said that he, Jesus gave no answer to the accusations. Jesus stood silent before his accusers. It says so much so that the governor marveled. So this man is different than anyone. Mine observations are telling me there's something different about this man. His own observations had made him 
a, you know, notice, take notice of this man, Jesus Christ. Then his wife was given a warning in Matthew 27. And I think we read that before. Did we go back there? Yeah, Matthew 27, 19. When his wife was given a warning in a dream about this man. Matthew 27, 19. When he, Pilate, was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying... Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And so his observations, the warning of his wife, and then his own testimony, I find no fault in him. So Pilate was, it says, the more afraid. And what was happening was inside of Pilate, like inside of you, like inside of me, where the real person exists, the soul, the spirit. There was a convicting of the conscience. And the first time we ever see the, the word afraid is back in Genesis 3 after they sinned in the garden. And it says, uh, I hid myself because I was naked and I was afraid. And, and what's happening is Pilate standing in the presence of God. And the fear is starting to take hold on the inside of him. Fear of the Lord is a good thing. But only if you'll respond to it and turn to the Lord in the right direction. Fear can often make you go in the wrong direction and flee and run. And Pilate is going to run to the wrong place rather than flee to the Savior. So Pilate was afraid, verse 9, and he went again into the judgment hall. And he saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Whence art thou? Where did you come from? That's, that's what he's saying. I mean, I, I just heard, you're the son of God. Now, Pilate's a superstitious man. Pilate had grown up in a culture that had a lot of superstition and myth associated with it. Uh, let me just show you a couple places to show you the culture Pilate grew up with. Uh, go to Acts chapter 17. And then after that, we'll turn back to Acts uh, chapter 16. Or, or 15, and I just want to show a couple places. Turn to Acts chapter um, 17. Pilate had grown up in a culture that was infused with the teachings of the Greeks. The Roman culture, the Roman Empire, had a lot of Greek influence upon it. It still is the same to this day. The Greek and the Roman influence is carried to this day throughout the world. Uh, the, the great European nations are built upon Roman Empire foundations with a lot of Greek philosophy. The, even in the United States, if you go to the capital, Washington, and you look at the buildings, those are Greco-Roman architecture. And the laws, the Senate that we have, that's the Roman Senate, that's where that came from, from the Roman Republic. And a lot of the, the uh, justice that we have, the lady with the, the blinders on and holding the scales of justice, that's Greek-Roman. That goes all the way back. The Roman Empire is still around today. It's kind of fractionated and broke up, and it's coming back together, as you see. The Treaty of Rome was signed in 1957, and now they're, they just had a meeting recently of the European Union and have decided to write a new constitution that will be signed in Rome. And it will be the Constitution of the European Union. For the first time, they're going to agree on a... Con they've agreed on a monetary system. Now they're going to agree on a new Constitution. And it will be Roman-based. And it will have a lot of Greek teaching in it. Pilate had grown up with this, obviously. And when Paul was in Athens, uh, verse 16, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. He saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, as a place where they would teach, and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. You folks are superstitious people. Uh, what, what type of superstition? Well, turn back a few chapters. Go to Acts 14. This is the kind of stuff that they believed. Pilate had grown up with this stuff. He had heard this stuff. I don't know how much he believed of it, but he heard a lot of it. He was familiar with it. He was a worldly man. Men of the world today are familiar with a lot of things. Uh, Acts chapter uh, 14, um, picking it up at verse 8. Here's uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas, and they're traveling around. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, uh, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. 
the same man heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving he had faith to be healed, Paul said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped on his feet and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter. And they called Paul Mercurius because he was the chief uh, speaker. And then the priest of Jupiter from the city of Lyconia or Lystra, uh, which was before their city, he brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So this was a, a, an area in Greece and Rome that had many religions many superstitions, many idolatrous practices, and they believed that gods came down from heaven and visited folks. So Pilate, you know, wow, you're the son of God. Are you one of those gods like Jupiter or Mercurius that have come down and visited us? This is where he's going with this. Now, this is an opportunity to go back to where we are in, in John 19. Pilate is a superstitious man. Pilate is a heathen. Pilate is a, a pagan, okay? Uh, a heathen, a pagan, um, heathen. The word heathen comes from the Greek word heath, which means village. The word pagan comes from the Latin word pagos, which means village. And what it means is, uh, in a condescending manner, <laughs> it means the only people with knowledge are people that live in cities. And people from the sticks or the villages or the rural area, they're, they're kind of unknowing. They're kind of dumb. They're kind of stupid. They're not really in on things. Now, truthfully, from God's standpoint, a heathen is someone who is unacquainted with the true God. That's how God uh, speaks of heathen. Through the Old Testament, you will see the word over and over. You don't see the word pagans. It's, uh, again, a more modern term come from Latin, and uh, it's used today. And, and heathen, or pagan practice, if you will, is associated with, in the Old Testament, filthiness. You read about this in the book of Ezra and the Psalms, and you read about the filthiness of the heathens. Uh, what? Filthy. Uh, they're just, they're filthy in that the way they live. Uh, they're, they're, they're full of uh, fornication, adultery, lasciviousness. They're just, it's a filthy lifestyle. It's not a clean lifestyle. In God's eyes, God created a male and the female, one woman for one man with the marriage bed uh, protected and surrounded by the covenant of marriage that God's given. And when you break that down, you're polluting yourself with the filth of heathen practice and the lascivious. It's America. America. Okay. Running around. I mean, the, the concept that uh, little kids, 14 and 15, should be running around and experimenting with each other sexually. That's taught it on every movie and every television and every teen magazine and in the schools. That's filth. That's the filth of the heathens. That's, that's the kind of stuff that uh, uh, God speaks of, the filthiness of the heathens. The, the heathens are associated with abominations. You read about this in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Ezekiel, the abominations. Abominations beyond filthiness. What would that be? Uh, sodomy, men working with men, that which is unseemly. Uh, women working with women, that which is unseemly. N leaving the natural use of the body into full-blown abomination. Abominations of murdering children. Heathens were affiliated with that. Well, that doesn't go on in America. I don't know. Uh, if you don't think... Uh, you know, babies in the womb are children. I guess it doesn't go on in America. But if you define those little babies inside the womb as children, then you've got the same type of uh, abomination and filth of heathen pagan practice in America. Uh, America today is a heathen pagan nation. You want to meet a pagan? Go to the mall. Okay, real simple. Talk to your average American. That's what America's become. And the abominations. And the other thing they're affiliated with is idolatry. The city was wholly given to idolatry. You read Psalm 115, Psalm 135, and, and you read a passage that just recurs in those two Psalms and, and all throughout the Scriptures. Turn to Psalm 135. Uh, Psalm 135, uh, starting in verse 15. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work 
of men's hands. He's talking about statues that were carved. These religious people no longer were acquainted. They were not acquainted with the true God. The true God of the Bible is a God of heaven. He is a spirit to be worshipped in spirit and truth. People that don't have a relationship with the true God end up, you know, say if a person doesn't believe in God, he doesn't believe in anything. No, the truth is if he doesn't believe in the true God, he'll believe in anything. It's not he doesn't believe in nothing. He'll believe in anything. He'll believe in any goofy religion that comes around that tells you how to wear your underwear or, or goofy, crazy things or, or how to get on a carpet five times a day or any kind of goof or get, how to bow down to a statue and light a candle next to it. Anything he'll believe when you don't believe in the true God. The heathen will fall for anything. If you won't fall down before the living God, in spirit and truth, you'll fall for anything. And so he says right here, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold. They're the work of men's hands. These statues, they have mouths, but they speak not. Uh, eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. Verse 18, they that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. W what does that mean? Well, is the statue alive or dead? It's dead. Anyone that makes those statues or bowed down to them is dead in God's sight. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They have no life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. They're dead. In God's eyes, it's a bunch of dead people bowing to a dead statue. No relationship with the living God. God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. So Pilate's a heathen man standing before the living God. And he's afraid. Now Jesus has opportunity right here, right now, to give the truth to Pilate. So go back to where you were in John 19. Pilate pulls him aside. And he asks him privately, You know, whence art thou? Where did you come from? Are you really one of those gods that came down from heaven? He opens the door for a good theological discussion. <laughs> Verse 9 end. But Jesus gave him no answer. Jesus gave him no answer. That's, is that strange? You find that strange? Why Jesus wouldn't tell him what was going on? Two reasons. Two reasons. One, a fulfillment of Scripture. I guess both a fulfillment of Scripture. One is a direct fulfillment of Scripture from Isaiah 53. But the second one is probably due to what we have seen already. Turn back to John 18. In John 18, after Pilate had examined the Savior, he said, now, now, Pilate's examining him carefully. And verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now, Jesus Christ at that moment gave light unto Pilate. He is the, the true light which lighteth every man that came into the world. And he said, here is some light for you to receive, Pilate. To that end I was born. I am a king. You are correct. You are correct. How did Pilate respond to the truth? He said unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again. He walked away from the truth that was revealed. And you know what? God's under no obligation to give any more truth to a man that's already rejected the light that he's been given. When God gives light and you reject it, then go back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verse 4. In Him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Word that was God from the beginning, in the Word, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, 
And here Jesus revealed his light. I am a king. And he turned from it. And here's what it says. And the darkness comprehended it not. When you turn from the light, then you lose any under, ability to understand it. You must receive it or reject it. You cannot understand it. And he chose to reject it, it says, and then he turned and went out from Jesus. In other words, the light was here and he turned from the light and went in that direction. And when Jesus saw that willful move, not only in his heart and in his spirit, but in his body, and he walked out, Jesus said, I need to reveal no more light to him. He has rejected that which I've offered him. And of course, the dark darkness comprehends it not. He stays in his confusion. When someone brings you the truth about Jesus Christ and tells you, you're a sinner, He's the Savior. You're dead in your trespasses and sin. He will give you life if you will bow the knee and repent. You must be born again. I don't believe that. What happens is you cannot compre comprehend what just happened in that transaction. You will walk away from it and you will not be able to explain it to someone else. You either receive light, reject light, but you cannot comprehend rejected light. And God's under no obligation to give you any more light. God does the same with a Christian. God's given you life through Jesus Christ. That's justification. Until God takes you to heaven, He'd like to sanctify you, and He will progressively give you more and more on that walk of faith. The Word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. And every time we turn from the light given in Scripture, God's under no obligation to take us any further. That's why you see so many Christians who are arrested in their development who what would be called maybe backslidden. Because they want to turn and they want to go back to their superstitious practices like Pilate. And then when they come and asking the question, God doesn't give them the answer because they did not respond to what he gave back there. God only continues to answer questions that you ask if you respond positively to the answers he's already given you. Uh, you know, I don't want to take that right now, Lord, but I got another interesting question about Ezekiel. He says, no, before we get to Ezekiel, I want to talk to you about Ephesians and the certain way you're supposed to walk down here and the certain way you're supposed to behave and not grieve my spirit and answer the truth to every man in love. Well, I don't want to exactly do that, Lord. I don't want to be one of those crazy Christians that passes out tracts or talks to people about my faith. I like to keep it private, but I like some understanding on deeper things in doctrine. I'm not going to give you that. I'm under no obligation to answer those things to you until you start living for me. And letting me live through you. Saved or lost, when you reject light, the answers stop coming from God until there's repentance. You don't turn from God's Son. And so Jesus didn't answer him, John 19. Jesus gave him no answer. He gave him no answer because he had already rejected light. I love getting answers from God. <laughs> I love that he gives more light as we come to him humbly. We don't want to be like Pilate, someone that turned away. Jesus gave him no answer. So then Pilate falls back. And also, I told you, the other reasons of Scripture one, if you turn to Isaiah 53, verse 7, you will see quickly that uh, one of the things the Lord Jesus Christ is doing is he's going to take the judgment for our sin and he's going to take it willingly, and he's going to take it quietly. And Isaiah 53, verse 7, he had just been beaten and mocked and scorned and had a crown of thorns placed on his head. And Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. <laughs> amazing, absolutely amazing. Just so contrary to our nature. Somebody accuses me of something, I'm the first one to defend myself. Here's someone that was sinless. You couldn't accuse him of anything. And he was, as a lamb, he was dumb before his shearers. He opened not his mouth. So Pilate then falls back on that which he knows best. He's a politician. He knows how politics works. He knows how the world works, and he knows how to get favor with people by using his power. And that's the way you get things down here. You use power. Maybe you use money to get favor with people. 
a reward in the bosom, uh, it says, and, and a gift of uh, perverteth justice. And so Jesus couldn't offer him any gifts, but, but Pilate thought, I can, I can get what I want out of this guy by using my power right here. Verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Hey, speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee? And I have the power to release thee? Now those are going to be very interesting words that Pilate speaks because they're not only written in the Scriptures. Someday when he stands at the white throne judgment, they're going to be brought up before him. <laughs> Because he just spoke out of his own mouth. Know you not, I have the power to release thee? Here's a man that truly was in a position that God had given him governmental authority and he could have released Jesus Christ. You're going to find out that Pilate is, is a coward. That's basically what he is. He's afraid, not of God, <laughs> not of his conscience. He's afraid of the people. And so, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Making a, a, a crucial error in his life here. Because he just admitted, I have the power to release you. And he did. He did. And he could have. And the story would be written different for him. And someone else would have come along and done the dirty work. He didn't have to volunteer to, to, uh, for these offenses. Like Jesus said, offenses must needs become, but woe unto them that cause these offenses. You don't have to volunteer to do bad work. You want to volunteer for something, volunteer to do something for God. Volunteer to do some good work down here. Well, these bad things are going to happen. Yeah, they are, but don't you partake in them. Don't you be a partaker of evil. What's well, written in the scriptures, all this bad stuff's going to happen. It is written in there, but don't you partake in it. Be ye not partakers with them. And so Pilate, making a crucial error here, now Jesus is going to show him the big picture. Because Pilate's eyes are on the world, political establishments, and earthly things. He's got that earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom that uh, James speaks about in the first chapter. And now Jesus is going to show him some wisdom from above, a greater truth. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. First thing I want you to understand, Pilate, you think by your connivings, and, uh, and your uh, committee meetings and your political activities that you were able to get this office. But the truth is God has allowed you to be in this office. And any place you are today, God has permitted you to be there. It's by the permissive will of God. I didn't say it's the perfect will of God. But God does have a permissive will. He permits a lot. I mean, you start thinking about it, it gets real deep. <laughs> Uh, those planes flying into those buildings on 911, he permitted that. That's not his perfect will. But he permitted it. He could have stopped it, and he didn't. The permissive will of God allows a lot of things. So if you're in a, in a particular place in your life, God has permitted you to be there. But now will you enter into his perfect will and do what he would have you to do in that position? This is the offer being made to Pilate right now. God's permitted you to be where you are, Pilate. Let me give you a truth that maybe you might want to act upon that will change your eternity and your destiny. You don't have any power except my Father had given it you from heaven. So, so, again, and I want you to understand that government, number one, you want to learn from this verse, government is ordained of God. Just let me show you a few verses. Turn to uh, Romans 13. One thing God, God knows a lot of things. You know what he knows about people? We're not basically good, we're basically evil. That does not mean that every single person on this planet is going to work the evil out of his heart to its maximum ability. Just like most people on this planet, save people, don't work their salvation and the good that's in their heart out to its maximum ability. People have a free will, and what's in their heart often doesn't get worked out. Thank God for that. Because if everybody acted on their evil impulses, I don't know that anyone would be left down here. But as God realized we have evil impulses, He realized there needed to be a government to stop and restrain the evil. That's the purpose of government down here, folks, is to restrain evil. The purpose of government is not to legislate morality or legislate good or cause people to do good. It's incapable of it. 
The Ten Commandments are incapable of causing you to do good. Only Jesus Christ and His saving power and the work of the Holy Spirit can get good out of something down here. There is none good save one, that is God and God's Son. And the goodness of God will lead to repentance and then lead to good works in your life if you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So government, God did not give government to get good things out of us. He gave government to restrain bad things out of those of us that are so inclined to doing evil, like stealing and murdering and stuff like that. Romans 13, 1, Therefore, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God has ordained government down here. Pilate, you have no power except a given from above. There wouldn't even be governmental structures down there determine they were needed. Good truth. Good truth. And uh, let me see, it talks about him, verse 4, talking about governments. The governor is the minister of God to thee for good. In other words, his, his job is to restrain evil, and that's good for you. <laughs> if the government would do its job, you probably wouldn't need security systems on your home. Because the criminals would be locked up. Now, we have injustice in America today, and we have uh, judges that love criminals and love to release them back into society. But if they would do what they're supposed to do according to the Bible, <laughs> it would be good for you and me. You wouldn't need those, those uh, bars to put on your steering wheel so they can't steal your car because they'd be locked up. You wouldn't need bars on your home because they wouldn't be getting in at night because they'd be locked up and behind bars. It'd be a lot safer. You wouldn't have to worry so much at the schools because the perverts couldn't get in. I mean, this is a minister of God, verse 4, to thee for good. Now, people abuse it, unfortunately. If thou do evil, be afraid, for he, the governor, beareth not the sword in vain. God's given government the ability to have capital punishment, to restrain evil. Capital punishment restrains and deters evil. How do we know that? The Bible says so. Well, the psychologists disagree. The psychologists are nuts. You know that, folks. Don't you know that? Do you know psychologists are crazy? Let's get back to basics. Watch any trial where someone's committed a murder. And one psychologist will be up there saying, he's not responsible for what he did. He's insane. And another clown psychologist will get up there and say, he is responsible. He's perfectly sane. Folks, if they can't make the diagnosis of insanity, which is the most depraved human condition, which is the most outside diagnosis there can be. We're not talking about a little neurosis here. We're not talking about someone having a problem getting to sleep at night. We're talking about full-blown insanity. If they can't agree on who's insane and who isn't, obviously they don't know anything. All right? Amen and amen. amen. I knew this before I was saved. Okay? It didn't take the Bible to reveal to me that psychologists were whacked out nuts. All right? I watched them as an unsaved man. I went to medical school. I sat through the psychiatry classes. I spent most of my time laughing in hysterics at the thing they said. So much so they had to call me in the dean's office and say, if you keep laughing, we're going to fail you. I said, but you guys are crazy. Do you hear what they're saying up there? <laughs> we finally worked that out. I did pass psychiatry. I don't believe anything they said, but I regurgitated enough to pass their exam. All right, anyways. <laughs> the, the death penalty deters evil. God knows. The psychologists don't. All right? So the, the authority is given by God, and you can read all the way through. I, I, do your own homework. Psalm 62, verse 11. Proverbs 8, verses 15 and 16. Daniel 4, 17, verse 32. Go through and read it on your own sometime. These governments are ordained of God, and, and Jesus has shown Pilate the truth. You wouldn't even be where you are if my father hadn't ordained government on this planet. And by the way, we should pray for people in government that they would fulfill the role God would have them to fulfill because they're going to stand before him someday as Pilate's going to find out at the judgment seat. Turn to John 19. So the first truth that Jesus tells Pilate right here is you wouldn't even be where you are if it weren't for my Father in heaven making government down here. You think you're such a hot shot. You ought to realize that you've been given a gift and that great gift comes with great responsibility to whom much is given, much is required. Don't you take this lightly. 
Don't you run out and have midnight pizza parties and have trysts with women in the Oval Office and think you're going to get away with it. To whom much is given, much is required. These people that lust for these positions of power and don't want to use them responsibly, we got tons of them. Then he gives him another truth. Verse 11, thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. And then the next truth, therefore, he that delivered me unto thee, he hath the greater sin. He hath the greater sin. Now who is he talking about? He's talking who delivered him? Caiaphas. Caiaphas, the high priest. The high priest delivered Jesus, a Jewish man, who is supposed to be under Jewish law, over to a Gentile authority to let a Gentile rule over a discussion that the high priest and the elders are supposed to come to right judgment on. And he hath the greater sin. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Next book over, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, and he said, Ye men of Israel... Why marvel ye at this? Why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when, he, when Pilate was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just. You desired a murderer, Barabbas, to be granted unto you, and you killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead. We're of, uh, we are witnesses this very day. Skip down, go down to Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Who delivered him up to Pilate? It was the leaders of the Jewish nation. It was Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. They delivered the prince of life unto a man that wanted to let him go. Acts chapter uh, 7 verse 51. Yes, stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost that did your fathers, so do ye. Which of the prophets have, have not your fathers persecuted? And, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. And so he's saying, you know, this, this Caiaphas is the one who has the greater sin. Why? He's received the law. Back in Exodus chapter 32, verse 35. I didn't write it down, I'll just read it to you. Exodus 32, 35. And the Lord plagued the people because they've received the law and they made a golden calf. Someone that, that knows the law and sins knowingly against the law has the greater sin than someone that sins in ignorance. The Lord plagued His own people and killed 3,000 people in one day because they made a golden calf. Why? They ought to know better. They have the law. Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin ought to know better. They have the books of Moses which testified of the coming one, the just one. And they delivered him over. They have the greater sin. Why is this? Think about this. Um, when an atrocity is committed by a private, but he does it under orders from a captain or a general, you know who has the greater sin? The one that gave the order. The, pilot, the private's like a tool just doing what he's told. Okay, think of it this way. Uh, I take a knife with my right hand and I stab someone. What has the greater sin, the hand or the head? <laughs> Started right up here. It was the wickedness in my mind that did it. This is just the instrument. Pilate's like the hand. He's like the private. Caiaphas is the brains. He's the head. He's the general calling the shots here. He has the greater sin. That's why James says in James chapter 3 and verse 1. Pilate is, or, or Caiaphas is someone that, that carried the phylactery and carried the law with him. And, and the people of Israel looked to him to make righteous judgment based on God's law. 
He was a teacher of the law. He was a master of Israel. Master was rabbi. And James says this in James 3 verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we, masters, shall receive the greater condemnation. Everyone wants to be a teacher. Everyone wants to be in the pulpit. Everyone... <laughs> Let me tell you something. You do that, you better be on your knees a lot. You better be in the book a lot because we receive the greater condemnation. We handle the law. <laughs> you know, I pray, God, help me to stand. Don't let me fall into sin. Why? I get the greater condemnation. I know what these things are in here. We were talking about this the other day. I mean, we were talking, you know, one of the sad things in Christianity is so many people now in the pulpits no longer believe the law. They no longer believe the Word of God. And you see them falling all over. We just heard of another example of a, of, a, of a pastor that ran away with the secretary. And then I heard another one of a pastor that had to leave a church because of adultery. And I just got a phone call yesterday of another one that had to leave. <laughs> they don't believe the book. And you can't stand without it. It doesn't effectually work if you don't believe it. And you're going to face the greater condemnation. Caiaphas is in, going to be in hot water. Pilate's going to get it, but wait till Caiaphas gets up to the judgment. John 19. I tell you, I tell you, you're better off, rather than being in the pulpit, be a politician. And don't call yourself the reverend so-and-so if you get into politics. Forget that too. Just go into politics and be a politician and be like Pilate. But don't try and be a Caiaphas. These reverend politicians confuse the heck out of me. First off, they steal God's name, Psalm 110, verse 9. They have no business taking the name reverend. And then secondly, running around claiming they represent God. Why? You're making government into a God. You're making people turn to government rather than to God. If you're a true reverend, which you're not, but if you were a teacher of the law, you would turn people to God, not to government. Government can't solve your problems. Amen. Okay, You're not going to get out of your wheelchair and walk because government's going to do stem cell research. Amen. You're going to get out of your wheelchair and walk when Jesus Christ comes back and gives you a new body. Amen. That's when you're going to get it. Amen. God's got the solution to the problems down here, not the government. Right. And there's going to be the poor among you as long as uh, there's sin down here. And the governments aren't going to eliminate poverty. Right. Jesus is when he comes back. Everyone will be under his vine and under his fig tree. God's got the answers. And they're found in the person of his son. Caiaphas has the greater sin. Going back to where we were in John uh, 19. And from thenceforth, Pilate, frightened, realizing, oh my goodness, I'm in this position I better use this position wisely. Let me see if I can release him through compromise rather than standing on principle. Verse 12, from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. I see, I, I can work these people. I know how these people work. I can just meet them at middle ground. You can't meet the enemy on middle ground. Amen, you have to stand your ground close to God and preach truth. And he wouldn't do it. But the Jews... And anybody that's against truth will not compromise with you. You're trying to compromise with them. They will not compromise with you because they cry out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And they're going to say, Away with him, crucify him. Ultimately what they're going to say. But now they're saying, You want to compromise? Let's, let's talk about a real king. Let's talk about Caesar here. Now, the name Caesar the Roman spelling of the name, six letters. Six is the number of man. My name's spelled with five letters. Five's the number of grace. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Okay. But anyways, that, that particular name is, is a derivative of the word uh, um, It's a derivative uh, that all comes from a, a, a root Tsar, 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 Kaiser, Caesar. It means monarch. It means, it means ruler. 
uh, it, it means like a, a, a prince. Uh, the dictionary says it comes from, that these words come from the old Russian czar or old Latin. But the dictionary is a little mistaken. I was doing some study on this. It doesn't come from Latin or Russian. What it actually comes from, Caesar, Tsar, whatever. If you take the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the letter Shin, and uh, forgive me if you're a Jewish scholar because my Hebraic writings are terrible. It looks something like a funny W with music notes on it. That's the letter Shin. And then you add the letter Resh to it, which looks like kind of an eighth note or seven. I don't, I don't write this very well. That's the letter Shin and the letter Resh. S, Shin, Resh, Sar, Sar. Those two letters put together equal Prince, Prince, the S and the R from Hebrew, they read in this direction. This is the letter Shin and the letter Resh, Tsar, Prince. And you'll find that word in, um, first time it's found in Genesis, next time you'll find it, you probably recognize it, is uh, Exodus chapter 2 and verse 14. Exodus 2 verse 14 with Moses when he was dealing with his people in Egypt and uh, he was saying to this one guy, why are you beating the guy up? And the, verse, the guy said in verse 14, and he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? As the guy responds to Moses. That's that word prince is Shin, Resh, Tsar, Sr. Now if you take those letters and then you add a couple more letters to them, you add the letter Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Aleph, Alpha, Omega, first letter. That's that letter Aleph, which looks kind of like a... Let me see if I can do it. It looks kind of like a funny X with uh, these two things in here. Again, forgive me. This is Aleph. And then you add Lamed, which is the twelfth letter of the uh, Hebrew alphabet, which looks kind of goes like this and comes over and then goes down in this direction. You've got Prince here. That will be this part of the word is Prince. Sar is Prince. And this, this word here now is the name of God. This is El, Elohim. That's God's name. And then when you add um, the, 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 the fifth letter, of the, the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet right here, every jot and tittle, when you put a little jot right in front here, like that, I, wrote, I did that wrong, let me see, it goes like this, the jot's like this, almost looks kind of like a question mark. When you put the whole thing together like that, you get this word, turn to Genesis 32. Genesis 32. A wrestling match that went on in Genesis 32, verse 27. And he uh, said unto him, uh, this is the, the angel of the Lord speaking to Jacob. He says unto him, what is thy name? The wrestling, the angel of the Lord's wrestling with Jacob. And he, Jacob, answered, said, Jacob. And he, the angel, verse 28, said unto him, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but here it is, Israel, Israel. When you put these letters together, when you put the Jod and the Shin and Resh of Prince, and you put the Aleph and uh, the Lamed of God's name all together, you get the name Israel, Sar. There's Prince. A Prince with God. That's what it says in the verse right here. Watch it. Thy name shall be no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a Prince hast thou power with God. The very name that they're using right there, Caesar, is drawn off the name Israel. Believe me, those Jewish people knew that. They were Hebrew scholars. And they were saying, you know what? We've rejected God. We've rejected our relationship with Him. And we want a prince. We'll take Caesar without God. That's what they were saying right there. We have no king but Caesar, they're going to say. 
We don't want God. They were rejecting the very relation, covenant relationship God had given them for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thou shalt no more be Jacob. Thou shalt be. You want to do an interesting study? I'll give you some homework. You turn to Psalm 119 and you read these verses. Read 73, uh, 161, 153, verse 1, and verse 89. Those five verses line up with these letters in Psalm 119. They line up with Jad, Shin, Rosh, Aleph, and Lamed. And that's a picture right there of a prince with God in those very verses in Psalm 119. That's your homework. You can do that. And so going back to where we were in John 19. There's a, I'll tell you, God created the languages. We're running out of time, Joey says. God created the languages. He created Hebrew. He created Greek. He created English. There's good stuff in all three of them. I find 99% of the good stuff in English, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. There's good stuff in Hebrew and Greek, too. I just don't know a lot of it, but once in a while I find some, and it's very interesting. That word Caesar comes from Sar, comes right from the middle of Israel, a prince with God, with power with God. And they said, you know, we don't want God. We don't want his power. We'll just take our own prince. They knew what they were doing. Caiaphas has the greater sin. Believe me. When he stands before God, he knows those letters better than anyone in this room does. And God knows he knows them. And they rejected God. So Pilate is in a rough spot here. Uh, he brings him before, it says, uh, verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying... He doesn't want any problem with Caesar. He may not know God. All Pilate knows is, is Roman authority. <laughs> the Jews, they have the greater sin. They know God. They're rejecting God. And Pilate, you're going to see his allegiance to his leader is greater than the Jews' allegiance to what their leader ought to be, which is God himself. Pilate therefore heard that saying. He brought Jesus forth and sat down on the judgment seat in a place that's called the pavement. In the Hebrew, they call it Gabbatha. And the pavement is a, is a, a place of heathen worship You'll have to do this on your own. 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 3 and uh, 17. And, uh, and it's just a place that they had learned. That there was the one king, I think it was Ahaz, Jotham's son. Uh, yeah, Jotham's son Ahaz was a wicked king, and he had turned to the Assyrians for help at one time. And he saw one of their altars, and he dragged that altar back into the Holy Land, and he made a pavement of stones to be a judgment place. Unbelievable. These are God's people doing this kind of stuff. And, and so now you see this. That it's, it's just another uh, example of Jesus being brought before heathen for judgment. Now listen, we bring bef Jesus before the heathen every day for judgment. And if they want to make the mistake of taking him to the pavement stone, they're making a, a big mistake. But you know, our job is still to bring him forth. What they do is their responsibility. Our responsibility is to bring him forth. Pilate's confused here. He doesn't know what to do. Verse 14, And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, he tries one more time, he says, Behold, your king. It was the sixth hour. Sixth hour is 6 a.m. 6 a.m. in the morning. They had done all this illegal work during the darkness of night when they weren't supposed to do their illegal trial. And Pilate now tries to bring him forth at 6 a.m. Now, in the Jewish reckoning of time, this is the morning. This is the time that the sun comes up. And God is purposely using it. He's bringing Jesus forth at the same time the sun is rising. At the very moment the sun's coming up, he has Jesus standing there, and probably the red sun is coming up right behind him in the morning. What's going on here? A couple of things. Let me show you quickly, and then we'll have to end. 2 Peter 1, 19. God is one more time trying to speak to the hearts of these people. 2 Peter 1.19 2 Caiaphas knows the law. He knows the prophecies of the Old Testament. 2 Peter 1.19 Wherefore we have... And now Peter, of course, is a Jewish man. He knows the scriptures. 
We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And here comes the day star up over the horizon. And here's Jesus standing before, behold your king. And God's trying to show them a picture. And you say, well, they would never get it because they're Jews. This is New Testament. Yeah, turn to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. There's a lot more going on here that meets the eye, and these people are responsible. Malachi chapter 4. The day star at 6 a.m. As the star comes up and Jesus is standing right before them, behold your king. Malachi 4.1, for behold the day cometh. Verse 2, unto you that fear my name shall the watch it, son of righteousness, arise. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And this is the day of the Passover, the day they're going to put him on the cross. And at morning, God's giving them a sign. As the sun comes up at six in the morning, and, a, and a, an unknowing Gentile says, Behold your king. And the day star comes up, and the sun of righteousness is about to arise with healing in his wings. And the people are going to respond in the next verse, Away with him, crucify him. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And we're out of time and we'll finish that verse next week. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. It's amazing. You know what's amazing to me? It doesn't surprise me so much that people like Pilate, heathen, you know, reject Jesus. They don't know any better. I'm always amazed at religious people, people that stand in pulpits, Catholics and Protestants alike, that reject the truths of Jesus of the Bible. I don't believe in the virgin birth. I don't believe in the, the literal resurrection of Jesus' body. I don't believe you must be born again. I don't believe in the creation account. Caiaphas is of today. Incredible to me. Absolutely incredible. Isn't it good to be saved? Why don't you let the day star arise in your hearts on Passover and receive the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, pictures here of Jesus Christ, the uplifted Savior, and the work he did on our part of redemption, and how he was rejected by many. Help us not to reject him, but to receive him today as our Savior. Help us to receive him in spirit and truth by faith. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.